Okay, thank you. So here is the title and the list of authors. And I will talk about what is authenticated encryption, probably not so, uh, much of a surprise for any of you. And what do you mean by robust authenticated encryption? Why do we need it? Uh, I will look at uh, generic uh, uh, transition from the SIV mode of operation to the RIV mode of operation. I will talk about the specifics of our instantiation of RIV and I will conclude with some remarks and an outlook. So authenticated encryption is the kind of thing that we as the metric cryptographers are, well, should consider our primary goal, not our final goal, but at least our primary goal. Alice and Bob share a secret key, okay? and Alice is sending some messages to Bob, and some bad guy is trying to read the messages, and some bad, same bad guy is trying to impersonate the messages, and Bob is able to decrypt the message, uh, while the bad guy doesn't figure out anything about the message except for its length, and Bob can figure out whenever the bad guy tries to impersonate Alice that this is a forgery. And uh, like um, 15 years ago, uh, we already know how to formalize this. So we have a plain text, we encrypt things, and we get a cipher text with some extra information that I call authentication tag. And uh, to get to make this uh, valid uh, deterministic function, uh, we have some uh, additional input, the nuns. The nuns captures uh, the, an internal state or internal randomness of our random function. So then with this additional input, we have a deterministic function. And also it may be important to authenticate context information. That's what this header input is for. So uh, this was pretty successful and we got pretty good systems that work very well. Assuming the nuns never repeats, well, and this models our internal state or randomness, uh, then uh, usually with some constraint on method length or number of blocks encrypted, we get very strong results. Authenticity uh, is uh, guaranteed and uh, resistance against chosen plaintext attacks, privacy is guaranteed. And when you have both, then the additional option of the adversary to make a chosen ciphertext query doesn't help the adversary because all attempted forgeries will be discovered and thrown away. Now the assumption here, the second assumption apart from the nuns never repeats, is that unverified plain texts are just thrown away and no information whatsoever leaks about unverified plain texts. And when we look at the schemes from the early 2000s, they were pretty, they seemed to do exactly what we wanted them to do. They were pretty strong, pretty fast, but whenever you actually violate one of these assumptions, then kaboom, all your security is gone. Uh, so this is why we may need authenticated, uh, robust authenticated encryption. And uh, so, and when we look where systems fail in practice, we will not always, there are other reasons why systems fail, but quite frequently uh, see uh, that actually either of these two assumptions is violated. So either some guy is eventually uh, accidentally, whatever, repeating a nuns and allowing the adversary to mount an attack where the same nuns and maybe the same header is used and you're changing the plain text, you get a different cipher text and authentication tag and then you can figure out something about your secret key or something uh, different. So in the chosen ciphertext setting, the adversary forges the ciphertext header nuns and makes the decryption query and our deterministic decryption algorithm tells us correctly, oh, this is a forgery, this is invalid. However, some information, maybe not all of the plain text, but some information about the plain text somehow leaks out and the adversary can use it. And these two are quite common, common patterns that you see in practice, uh, practical attacks. So maybe we as cryptographers didn't do such a good job with modeling our attacks and, well, proving security in, in these settings. So, um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so uh, there has been some research in improving this, and actually the first such attempt is 10 years old, uh, is the SIV mode by Rogaway and Shrimpton. 
And it's an offline scheme that preserves security when you reuse nonces. So preserve security means you will get not exactly the security you, you do usually expect, because usually you expect when you encrypt the same plain text, you will get random cipher texts. Um, and here, of course, when all your inputs are the same, you will get the same output. So the fallback security under NANS reuse is what they call deterministic authenticated encryption. Uh, so your, the encryption scheme leaks when so the ciphertexts are exactly identical when the plaintexts are exactly identical. But when under NANS reuse, uh, the, cipher, the, sorry, the plain text changes, then yeah, you will just get independent random ciphertexts. So this is a, a pretty strong security, and of course, authenticity is preserved just as well. But the drawback of this scheme, the practical drawback, is that this is an offline scheme. So you, before you can release the very first bit of ciphertext, you must have read the entire message. And for some applications, you can live very well with such a restriction. For some applications, you just can't. Uh, so the, then we studied uh, offline schemes. Now, offline schemes, uh, robust offline schemes, or offline schemes resistant to um, NANS reuse have to be weaker. So, deterministic authenticated encryption is achievable only for offline schemes. When you go to online schemes, you get some weaker security notion. Essentially, your ciphertext leak information about joint plain text prefixes. So if the plain texts are different but have joint prefixes, then you, key the, then you key, see uh, identical prefixes of approximately the same length in the ciphertext. Uh, apart from that, you get the same kind of robustness. So uh, at this conference four years ago, we described MacOE. Now, MacOE, as presented at this conf conference, wasn't secure under the release of unverified uh, plain texts but we have a, a younger version of macOE that does that. Actually, it's a very simple modification. So then that would be the next step. You want something to be online and resistant to nuns reuse and providing security when you release unverified plain texts. Uh, and still, you know, you have a, the weaker privacy because of the weaker fallback privacy under nuns reuse because under NANS reuse, you leak information about plain text prefixes. So, this, so there is certainly a, a, a need for both, for offline schemes that give you the maximum ass security assurance even when you are releasing, uh, when you are reusing NANSes, and for online schemes where you get some slightly degraded compared to deterministic authenticated encryption, where your fallback security is slightly degraded. But this talk is about an offline scheme that's secure under NANS reuse and under the release of unverified plaintext. Before I'm going there, uh, one more warning about online schemes. So usually when you say I have an online scheme and maybe even an online scheme that's secure under the release, uh, sorry, uh, secure under NANS reuse, then you expect something pretty strong. And uh, for some strange reason, you may expect that you are also allowed when you are performing online encryption. So you get um, plain text uh, uh, bytes and you emit ciphertext bytes before having read the entire plain text. You may expect that you can also do it the other way around. So when decrypting, you read a couple of plain text, sorry, a couple of ciphertext bits, and you start emitting your plain text bits before you have read the entire ciphertext. Now, of course, then you are violating your security contract because you are releasing unverified plain texts. So this is something you should never even think about doing, except when you are actually have a scheme that's designed to be secure under the release of unverified plain texts. Okay, so much about the warning. And there's something, okay, again, that happens frequently or is misunderstood frequently in practice. Um, so there are a couple of different attempts or, well, uh, steps uh, to model what we understand by robust authenticated encryption. So the first one is three years old from Boldieva at other authors, 
and it captures apparently the most practical setting. I mean, who would think of releasing the entire unverified plain text? This is something unlikely to happen, what, but what in practice happens is you are releasing some information about checksums or about something being able to validate parse as something or not. Uh, so you, you uh, behave differently depending on some internal error when you handle the, uh, internally handle the unverified plain texts. So this is uh, what, what's modeled in this uh, setting. Now this, this appears to be the most practical, but the very, very big disadvantage of this is when you are using this definition to design a new authenticated encryption scheme, it's, it's, it, it's mostly worthless because you need to anticipate what your authenticated encryption scheme will be used for and what kind of information the adversary may gather from, you know, handling, uh, processing the unverified plaintext before its authenticity has been established uh, or not. So, André, Eva, and others uh, modeled this uh, 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 at allowed the adversary to get all the uh, uh, unverified plain text, and this is the setting that we also consider. Uh, then Huang and others uh, enhanced this model by allowing the adversary to choose what I would call the length of the authentication tag. Uh, this is nothing allowed by RIV, so uh, RIV would be robust in the sense of, oops, uh, in the sense of uh, the model by Andrea Wertel. And finally, Barwell and others uh, defined another notion that essentially captures all the three above notions and generalizes these. So, uh, would, as part of your definition, you define a leakage function. Uh, and then uh, you can either leak everything or you can leak uh, just um, uh, uh, error information, whatever. Uh, so there are a couple of robust authenticated encryption schemes. Uh, three made into the second round of CISA. Uh, that's our submission POET and uh, that's APE. Both are offline schemes and that is easy. Uh, which is an, uh, sorry, they're both online schemes, and that's easy, that's an offline scheme that's closest to our scheme. Now, easy is uh, interesting uh, by its proof then prune approach. So they initially define it as a mode of operation for a block cipher, and they have a formal proof of security that the whole thing is secure if the block cipher is secure, and this Block cipher made things actually pretty slow because encrypting two blocks of messages makes five block cipher calls. And because it's too slow, they then reply, replace their block cipher calls by four rounds of AES. Now, in that case, the underlying assumption is obviously wrong. Four rounds of AES are not a strong block cipher. That doesn't mean that easy is. Uh, insecure, but it does mean that easy is just an AES-based primitive of its own right. It's definitely not a block cipher mode of operation. Or actually, you can use an easy block cipher mode of operation, but then it would be pretty slow. Uh, there are, I think, four or five other uh, uh, of, uh, robust authenticated encryption schemes that we could find uh, that either didn't quite fit the Caesar call or were too late for Caesar. And there's a general result that any strong, tweakable pseudorandom permutation with some appropriate encoding of your messages can be turned into a, a robust authenticated encryption scheme. I'd like to point out that IRV doesn't fit this theoretical approach because IRV is based on the three-round Feistel network, which we know is not a strong pseudorandom permutation. So, uh, going to the generic construction, so this is how SIV looks like. You have a PRF, you feed in the header, the nonce, and the message, and you, whenever header, nonce, or message changes, then you get a new random authentication tag, and the authentication tag is fed into the counter mode to randomly determine the start value for the counter mode, uh, and then you get a, uh, random key streams, and everything is random and fine. Even when you are reusing the nuns, 
and the header, when the message changes, you get a new random authentication tag and everything is fine. Now, when you're looking at uh, chosen self-attack queries and releasing unverified messages, uh, actually the attack becomes fairly easy. Whatever you're doing with your ciphertext and whatever you're doing with your header and nuns, same tag means same key stream, and that means uh, attacking your scheme gets really easy. So uh, SIV really blows in pieces whenever you are allowing to release unverified plain texts. So this is where RIV comes in, and we just use a third round. Uh, so we are using the PRF twice, and we model this as two independent PRFs. So uh, we, what was the authentication tag uh, is now the uh, green R, and this green R is kind of encrypted using a second call of the pseudo-random function and XORing the output with R to get the real authentication tag. Now, when we are proving the security, essentially the core idea for the proof is R never repeats uh, up to, the, up to uh, birthday bound. Uh, so R never repeats, and that means we all get plenty of independent key streams, and all is fine, and the authentication tags are also random. So in a chosen plain text query, uh, well, whenever a header nuns or message changes, then R is in fresh random value, uh, same as SIV. Now, in a chosen ciphertext query, there are two different cases. Either header, nuns, and ciphertext, one of them changes, then we get a new random R, or header, nuns, and ciphertext are exactly the same, but the tag changes. Now, that means we have not a new random R, we have a known non-zero difference in R, and again, our uh, counter mode will turn this new R into a random start value for our counter and do the encryption operation and everything is fine. So this is why, this is very briefly why this works and is uh, quite safe. So we try to get, uh, to make this uh, an efficient instantiation and I'm not talking about counter mode, it's quite straightforward, but the two pseudo-random functions uh, may be of interest for your designs. Uh, so, uh, uh, we are encrypting under the AES the output of uh, universal hash function, H. Uh, and uh, the input to H is used by some proper encoding. We are encoding a message, nuns, header, and, well, the index. We, remember, we have two independent pseudo random functions. So the one or uh, two uh, is also part of the input to the single pseudo-random function that we actually have. And uh, then this um, um, universal hash function, uh, H is based on um, CL hash, uh, published last year, and C the core of CL hash is the pseudo dot product hash. And the pseudo dot product hash is essentially you take a part of your message, a block of m64 bit words, and you have a key of another m64 bit words, and then you are performing that operation. And what you see is that you have uh, m divided by two uh, multiplications. Uh, and this operation is pretty fast. Uh, we benefit from uh, a new instruction that is on most modern processors nowadays uh, that has been, apparently, has been uh, introduced or invented uh, uh, to speed up Galois counter mode, and one of the old authenticated encryption modes, but we benefit from this. And now, uh, CL hash would provide only a 64-bit output, but we need 128, so we are calling CL hash twice, and to, we don't want to double our internal key length, so we are using some tuplex extension, so instead, uh, so uh, the M 64-bit words become M plus two 64-bit words, as the equation uh, or the expression down there uh, shows. And this is uh, pretty fast, so easy is the fastest, but remember the proof then prune approach, so, uh, with, as a block cipher mode of operation, 
easy would be about at the gray bar. So it would be one and a half times slower. And easy is essentially as fast as just running. Uh, so easy as instantiated here using internally four round AES is just as fast as a counter mode alone. Uh, then there are two recent proposals for generic uh, instantiations of the SIV scheme. Uh, this is what you see here. And these are our implementations. So this is essentially uh, SIV number is RIV without the last round. And you see the difference between these two uh, rectangles or the difference between these two rectangles shows you, or the ratio, shows you what you pay for resilience to uh, the release of unverified uh, messages. Uh, and finally, the number there indicates the number or the size of the key that we use for CL hash. Uh, so uh, the slower version is using a 256-byte key, and the faster version is a 1024-byte key. So the bigger the internal key, uh, the faster the whole CL hash uh, works, of course. Uh, so some remarks and an outlook. So RIV is a new mode of operation based on SIV uh, for uh, using a block cipher and a universal hash function uh, uh, that provides, it's an offline mode, that provides offline authenticated encryption that is robust in the sense of being resilient or resistant to uh, both reusing the nuns and releasing unverified plain texts. Uh, and uh, it's provably secure uh, if the block cipher is secure, unlike easy. Uh, it doesn't use the inverse, it's easy parallelizable. It, uh, if you have a static header, so the associated data are the same, then you can cache the result. And finally, uh, I'm waiting for your ideas and suggestions on this. Uh, so I'm not sure if with this definition of robustness we are already done and we are, I'm not sure if we have, at this point we have done a good job. So maybe instead of going to better performance or something, we should look at where do our systems still fail even if we have robust schemes in the sense that we have today. So one thing possibly to consider could be side channel attacks or leakage resilience. Another thing to consider could be resistance to algorithm substitution attacks. So implement some probabilistic or state-based uh, schemes such that you can possibly verify the, ex the hidden existence or verify the non-existence of a covered backdoor. And maybe there are other ideas that you can tell me now or later today or tomorrow or so offline. Thank you.